Hello, I'm Ken Kinter. I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University. And the purpose of this presentation is to review and discuss the book Madhouse, A Tragic Tale of Megalomania and Modern Medicine by Andrew Skull. As always, if you like what you're hearing, go tell somebody. Uh, also welcome uh, comments and feedback and ideas for future presentations. Uh, before we get rolling, uh, credit where credit is due. Uh, the project that I work for that makes these videos possible is something called the State Hospital Psychiatric Rehabilitation Initiative. It is a uh, initiative that is shared by Rutgers University, New Jersey's Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services, and the New Jersey Department of Health. Uh, they provide financial and other support, which makes our work in the hospitals possible. Our goals in the hospitals of New Jersey, specifically the state psychiatric hospitals, is to improve quality of care, introduce evidence-based practices, and improve working conditions. So they make it possible, so kudos to them. Now, as far as getting started with this presentation, this is not a book report and should not be used as such. Uh, the opinions expressed in this video are mine, not that of Rutgers University. Um, I definitely recommend the book, so let's get that out of the way. And I'll also say that neither myself nor Rutgers University has any financial investment in this book. So it doesn't matter to us whether you get it or not, except that it's a really good book. It talks about a particularly uh, dark period of time, specifically in New Jersey State Psychiatric Hospitals, but I also think it has broader applicability. So the objectives in this presentation is to make the argument that you should get the book, let's be honest. Uh, and to talk about the story that it tells in the context of where medicine and psychiatry were at the given time, which is about 100 years ago. And we're also going to talk about how this isn't just a book about something that happened 100 years ago, how it is always in danger of happening in some form or another, and maybe even some form of what may be happening somewhere uh, today. So it, it is a cautionary tale as much as being a tragic tale. So let's rewind to the early 1900s. And the state of medicine and psychiatry at the time. Now, this was a time of huge leaps forward in different uh, sorts of medicine, as far as vaccines go, as far as medications go. Uh, there were there were many breakthroughs happening in the field of medicine, and psychiatry wanted in on that, but we hadn't quite had our magic bullet, so to speak, in our field just yet. Uh, so, I mean, all of these things were being developed and psychiatry wanted to keep pace, of course, with the, the rest of medicine. Another piece to throw in is that, uh, to my observation, in the 30 plus years I've been in the field, there's been sort of this pendulum going back and forth. And sometimes we move way over toward environmental causes for mental illness and the importance of environmental and more social and more talk oriented treatments for mental health issues. And then other times we swing over much more over to the biological side, where psychiatry starts to look a whole lot more like the rest of medicine. And this pendulum has gone back and forth during my career. And at this period of time, it was swung way over toward the biological side, where um, almost psychodynamic and talk sort of therapies were almost scoffed at. Um, at this point, medicine had a very uh, reductionist view which is the idea that mental illness was really just caused by biological causes, almost a symptom of a medical condition instead of being a condition on its own. Uh, this tradition had started in Europe, particularly Germany and England, and found its way over here um, uh, through Dr. Cotton and through some of his peers. Connected to reductionism is something called alienism, which is again, that mental illness is really just a manifestation of physical disorders. However, once it got to the brain, it was now incurable, irreversible. Um, in fact, they viewed it as a type of death, a social death, a mental death, metaphysical death, and uh, of course, a very stigmatized uh, type of death as well. And I think you have to take that into consideration when you're looking at the justification for these treatments that I'm going to be talking about going forward. It was even to the point where they said that psychiatrists had hesitations about curing people because if you cured people, that meant they were only going to give birth to more, quote, defective people. And so you were making the problem worse. That's a tough way to go about your job. And, and of course, we also find that it was also wildly inaccurate. So treatment at the time in the absence of psychotropic medications was really about confinement uh, and storage, locking people up or warehousing people, uh, rest physically restraining them for the course of years. 
Uh, so treatment was, uh, to call it in its infancy, was prob would probably be giving it too much credit. It was still in a very uh, early, the word barbaric is coming to mind, that's my word, uh, stage of treatment at the time. So one of the major developments is that there were a lot of people in state psychiatric hospitals that had syphilis. They were in the final stage of syphilis. And when it was found that there was a medication that could treat that, that became for Dr. Cotton and other people kind of the silver bullet. Like, okay, we found a microscopic source that's causing these psychiatric conditions. If we treat that, we successfully treat the person in a medical or surgical sort of way. So what this led to was uh, people getting injections into their spine and into their brains uh, to be treated for uh, this final stage of syphilis. And we'll see how that applies going forward. That was sort of the the genesis of this master key we'll talk about. So a little background on Trenton Psychiatric Hospital. Um, Trenton Psychiatric Hospital was really the first state psychiatric hospital in the United States. There were other hospitals that were well, operating before that, that had been under, uh, uh, they'd been managed by a church or by a city. But Dorothea Dix, who had advocated to Congress for the founding of these hospitals, this was the first one she referred to it as my firstborn child, and she lived there for the remainder of her days. So she advocated for it, got it, lived there, and 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 ultimately died there. And there's a shrine there to her uh, to this day, um, to her contributions to the field. Fascinating, uh, fascinating person. Now, uh, this hospital opened in 1848 and quickly filled to a few thousand, two or three thousand people. And in the early 1900s, there was an outbreak of dysentery, and there was concern that the dysentery outbreak, was, which was caused by unsanitary water and large numbers of people in one place, there was concerns that the outbreak would spread beyond the hospital into the city itself. And that set the stage for the ouster of uh, Dr. Cotton's predecessor and led to him being brought in. So we talk about Dr. Cotton, let's, let's talk about the ideas that he espoused. And, and predominantly that idea was something called focal sepsis. And that's the idea that mental illness was caused by an infection. And your goal was to get to the infection as soon as possible before it got to the brain. Now, again, we were talking before about syphilis and these injections into the skull or into the spine to treat this. Well, he just took this same concept of syphilis and just applied it across the board to all forms of mental illness. Again, with a real lack of data or research showing that that actually was valid. So his idea then became, and, and, and this was a progression. It was a, a series of steps doubling down one after the other. So he started out by saying, hey, these people have infected teeth. So these infected teeth or these metal fillings are contributing to an infection, which eventually becomes focal sepsis, which eventually becomes mental illness. So let's remove their infected teeth. And then when that wasn't seen as effective, he took it to the next step. Well, let's remove the wisdom teeth. Then let's remove all teeth. And then it keeps going. And you can see in this graphic on, on the right, which I believe I'm, blo I'm blocking part of, it worked its way from the mouth all the way down into the digestive system to the point where partial, then full colonectomies were being done, stomach was being removed, duodenum was being removed, and then ultimately it went to the reproductive organs. Um, interesting fact that 70 to 80% of the patients that were being operated on this manner were female, even though they were about 50% of the census of the hospital. Uh, there isn't The book doesn't go into much further detail about that, but that's something to think about. Now, it's also worth mentioning that these surgeries at the time had a 30% mortality rate, which is comparable for those surgeries in medical facilities at the time. However, again, these were being done on people that didn't have any diagnosed medical issue and for the most part were relatively young and res relatively physically fit. So 25 to 30% of the people that are getting these surgeries die, and we'll get more into that as we go. So a little background on Dr. Cotton, uh, great resume, trained at Johns Hopkins, the University of Maryland. Uh, Adolf Meyer was one of the best known uh, psychiatrists in the country and, and, and functioned as Dr. Cotton's mentor. The time period where, that's discussed in this book was Dr. Cotton's period of time as medical director at Trenton Psychiatric Hospital, which was 1907 to 1930. 
In addition to this, he was teaching at Princeton University. And another interesting point was he also ran a private hospital in Trenton called Charles Hospital. So private paying clients were going there. So he worked for the state, but also had this sort of burgeoning private practice and business. And many of the staff who worked in the state hospital also worked in this private facility. And I'm going to leave that right there for you to figure that one out yourself. So during the course of these 23 years of thousands of surgeries with one third of the people getting these surgeries dying, you were probably wondering, well, what stops this? What happens to prevent uh, this from continuing or from getting worse? And there were efforts. There were efforts by people at other hospitals, for example, Kapelov and Cheney, um, a doctor, Dr. Greenacre, who's pictured at, at the, the right here, was sent and she spent 18 months putting together a report that was promptly buried that showed that the cure rates that Dr. Cotton was talking about, which we'll go into a little more detail, were vastly overinflated and unsubstantiatable. And in the meantime, you had this extremely high mortality rate. Um, her story, which I will not go into further, is detailed much better in the book. And she really is a, a tragic but heroic figure uh, in, in the story of this. There were also political efforts. The Bright Committee in 1925 was trying to find out what was going on in the hospital, response to allegations from former staff and former patients and family members. But very powerful people kept this all under wraps. There was another report, uh, Katz and Bogan's report of Charles Hospital, what was going on in the private hospital, and the Frankel report. So there were numerous attempts to to rein this in, but none of them were successful and no one seemed to have the authority to just make this stop because all while these investigations are going on, while Dr. Cotton's results were being disputed, it only accelerated. You know, again, it was a process of continually doubling, uh, doubling down. So I'm hoping you can see this. This is from the uh, this is from the Frank the Frankel report at the end, and this gives you some of the statistics. Now, Dr. Cotton was claiming an 85% cure rate. Now, how you can have an 85% cure rate and 30% mortality is a really good question. Do you haul the deceased out? Do you consider them cured? There, there's no other way that works. So the the numbers were definitely not verifiable and, and never were verified by anyone else who came in. They found the cure rates to be closer to 15 to 20%, which was identical to other facilities at the time. But then let's throw in, let's take a look at these uh, rows below. The different surgeries had anywhere from a 13 to a 44, 45% mortality rate. Um, yet they were allowed to uh, continue over the course of many years. And then you see the next biggest percentage still in the mental hospital. And then when you get to the right, the clear part, you see recovered, improved, unimproved. These numbers are not impressive, but Dr. Cotton was being asked to speak in other countries and at, at, at all these heavy duty functions uh, because of his alleged success rate of 85%, which we never saw any quantifiable um, data of. So the highlights of the presentation or lowlights as the case may be, he performed involuntary surgery on his patients for 23 years, claiming outstanding results without proof and despite a high mortality rate. Uh, focal sepsis has been debunked as being a source of, of mental illness, but that didn't stop him from doing this treatment over all a period of time. And actually, at the end, he was removed from his position, but he was on his way to reclaiming it at the time of his death um, in, I believe it was 1933. So he really wasn't that discredited. He was kind of moved off to the side and then was on his way back in with his political connections as the time of his, his sudden death. And believe me, I'm not telling the whole story of Dr. Cotton. There's a lot better stuff in the in the book. Um, there was no data that he could provide to back up his claims of his astronomically high recovery rate. Uh, however, the lethality rates were, were, were documented. Thousands of people suffered and died in his care, and in many cases suffered needlessly. Let's think about units full of people who have had all their teeth removed. They can't eat. They can't digest properly. Um, they talk about the stigma of mental illness. As soon as you knew a young person had all their teeth removed, 
their ability and desire to socially interact or to get back in the workforce or do any of the things that we talk about in recovery was actually reduced by the severity of this unsubstantiated uh, treatment that was not backed by science. Uh, there are questions about Dr. Cotton's mental fitness, uh, mental fitness while he was in charge of the hospital, and I'll leave that one to you to read to read in the book. And last but not least, is those working in and with these facilities have the responsibility to make sure nothing like this ever happens again. Now let's let's follow the story up with an epilogue, and that is that um, following this, even with Dr. Cotton leaving, the surgeries continued. Uh, they diminished in severity and number. But they, it didn't go anywhere. And then shortly afterwards, this, is, this all predates the development of the prefrontal lobotomy. So all through the 40s, they were punching holes in people's heads and cutting parts of their brains. Again, not backed by data, not backed by research, but widely done. Uh, and of course, old school ECT and all those sorts of things. So the challenge that, that I see in the discussion point that this book raises for us is even today, a hundred years later, uh, people with mental illness are still face a lot of challenges. They are still confined. They are still restrained physically. They are subject to medications that are very dangerous for them and have all sorts of really frightening side effects. Um, however, the idea of the field always trying to do the best that it can and always being open to the next new development, but it really speaks to the importance of I would say two things. One, the connection between research and practice, observable, verifiable, publishable research. Uh, you know, research that can be replicated by someone else so that I don't just say I have an 85% cure rate because I feel like promoting myself and nobody says any different and people suffer because of that. And the other piece is a piece of accountability. Where is the part where someone can say, okay, stop? You need to stop doing this. You know, the, the old Hippocratic oath, you are now doing more harm than good and it needs to stop. And those things did not, uh, they, they did not succeed in this case. The regulating bodies, the other people around, that whole system broke down and many, many, many people suffered mightily uh, because of it. And we have to watch that today. Some of the elements of Dr. Cotton's story are still with us today. Those of us who work in the hospitals, and those who work with the hospitals, um, you know, we're familiar with this. You can't just take data because somebody says something as, as gospel. You know, trust but verify, I guess, is the uh, the saying there. So anyway, uh, I, again, I definitely recommend getting the book. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And I will see you next time.